you. Okay, Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you to start the proceedings. Oh, no, Francis, uh, you oh, go ahead. Oh, I'll go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mark has already given uh, an intro into the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, Samir Gandesha for his, the talk that he, our keynote uh, lecture. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Economics, Justice and Policy Studies at Mount Royal University. Um, I'm very, very, I'm, I'm very happy that we have Samir uh, here to give us the keynote lecture. I know that this is a bit um, unusual, or at least uh, it's, it's from an ideological perspective that many uh, uh, SAFS members are not used to hearing, and that is what we're trying to do. Um, I think it's very, very important now to have the echo chambers dismantled. Uh, we need to do this. This is a big problem, and, and it could potentially be a problem for organizations like the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. We need to have other viewpoints infused into our organization, and everyone should feel free to challenge those new perspectives to the full extent that they can. So that's the idea here, is to be able to do that. And I think Samir um, is a very is a very, very good um, uh, representative of a particular ideological perspective. The thing that I like about Samir is that he seems very, very open to the discussion. So we can hopefully today, or we're not going to get to the bottom of it all at, at the end of today, but we'll, we'll at least raise some questions, which I think um, could, could um, form the basis of, fu of future discussions with respect to um, examining various issues concerning ap academic freedom, open inquiry, critical thinking, those sorts of things. And as I mentioned, the, the reason why I became so interested in Samir's work was because he uh, had written a, a, an article in, in a journal called Open Democracy, where he took on many of the problems that uh, existed with respect to trying to shut down discussion on the basis that that discussion would cause harm to uh, marginalized groups. And I, I think this is a major issue that we need to tackle um, and one that is very, very difficult because no one wants to be seen as supporting um, efforts to further marginalize people. So we're always in a bit of a bind with respect to that kind of area. I should also mention as well, um, there's an excellent panel discussion that Samir uh, mentioned last night about uh, the arts, um, freedom of expression in the arts, and uh, on the left particularly, um, which is my interest as well. And there's a number of very, very good panelists, and it was about the Sky Gilbert case. And there was, a, I don't remember her name, but she was a, a, a representative, I think, of a civil liberties association. And um, she said that there's, there's a number of reasons why we support freedom of expression. Um, many support it because they're afraid that their ox will be gored. Uh, they, they, they don't want to shut down freedom of expression because they, they can see that they might be the, the one who's going to be next in terms of having their freedom of expression uh, uh, undermined. And, and that's, that's, that is a one reason, but she said that's not the main reason. The main reason is as intellectuals, if we're going to call ourselves intellectuals, uh, which I, I think people in universities have at least a pretense that they're there because uh, they are looking at knowledge, they're pursuing the truth, they're trying to discuss ideas, um, that um, we have to be open. Well, she used the word humble, and I'm not sure if humble is the right word, but we certainly have to be open intellectually to the possibility that we could be wrong in our views. And, and there's, there's no way we're gonna be able to make that determination if we close ourselves off and we don't allow new viewpoints to become, you know, to, to come into our consciousness and to engage with those new viewpoints. So um, with, I, I think everyone should keep that in mind when they're listening to Samir. Like there's a lot of things that Samir and I, I'm sure, well, I know we do, because he was talking about the indigenous rights uh, aspect. Uh, last night. Um, there's, there's certainly that and there's probably others, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a discussion. In fact, I'm very curious 
about what Samir's position is on Indigenous rights. And I think we should all kind of, as intellectuals, academics, um, take that attitude uh, when we're entering into discussions and, and not just assume that we're right and we're just going to go and defeat everyone who disagrees with us. We have to be open and that's what I'm hoping uh, will happen today. So, in terms of uh, Samir Gandesh's qualifications, uh, for people who are unaware, um, he is the director of the Institute for the Humanities at Simon Fraser University. Uh, he has a huge biography uh, that is full of all sorts of scholarly publications. Um, he examines the relationship between politics, aesthetics, and psychoanalysis, uh, which would be very interesting to try to see how those are all interrelated. Uh, and most recently, he has produced a collection of essays called Spectres of Fascism, which is being published by Pluto Press. And today, he is going to be talking about the Canadian case, which is great. Uh, and the title of his talk is, Is Academic Freedom Under Attack in the Canadian University? Thank you very much. Take it away, Samir Gandesha. Thank you so much, uh, Francis, for the introduction. Thanks again, Mark, uh, for the invitation. Um, thanks, Robert, for um, all the um, support uh, infrastructure. Um, so just a, a couple of clarifications. The, uh, the book is, is not a, a collection of my essays alone, but it, um, we have a number of um, contributors who have uh, contributed to the, 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 the book. Um, and also should just say that I, I'm speaking on my own behalf as opposed to uh, representing the Institute uh, of the Humanities in any way. Um, I also want to start off by acknowledging that I am speaking from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, uh, the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam and Squamish na nations. And I, I think this is uh, important in light of uh, what was said earlier. And, and Francis, thank you for asking me about um, my position uh, here on this question. I would like to just briefly try and articulate uh, what that uh, might be because it does relate to um, some of the arguments I want to make substantively in in my uh, talk. I situate myself in the tradition of critical theory with a capital C and a capital T which typically within the social sciences and humanities refers to the Frankfurt School for social research um, and many of its key figures such as Theodore uh, Adorno and Jürgen Habermas um, have routinely engaged directly with their philosophical and political opponents. Right? I think this is really an important um, uh, aspect of, of my approach. And it's in this spirit that I appear here. I think that there are, there are some really significant differences, um, I think, between myself and, and the kinds of discussions that, that have been um, had so far. I also want to say unequivocally that I myself stand in solidarity with black and brown communities that um, have been uh, over the centuries subjected to structural uh, violence, the structural violence of inequality, um, colonialism, and, and as we're seeing in, in the United States and also in this country, police brutality, which maintains that structure. And I think as a, I think as a historical materialist, Francis, you would know that Class structure is maintained by both consent and coercion, maintained by um, uh, a um, structure of violence. Here I stand, I can do no other. I, I have to make these statements. I've experienced uh, racism personally. I've seen it on the street. Um, I've been subjected to uh, very heavy-handed policing uh, when I was part of a peaceful protest uh, in my student days outside of the um, uh, South African embassy uh, in Trafalgar Square um, in 1985-1986. Um, I've also seen the way in which uh, in confrontations in the 1970s um, between the uh, immigrant communities, um, such as uh, is my own in Britain, uh, on the one hand, and um, neo-fascist organizations, National Front and British Movement, police would be inevitably on the side of uh, the uh, neo-fascists. So I think this is a, a larger context that's quite important. But I also have to say that one of my motivating uh, concerns with um, identity politics is this, the 
kind of racism that I've seen in East Africa, which is where my family's from, uh, on the part of the Indian community vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the black community, vis-a-vis -vis the black African community. I think this has been quite, uh, quite powerful in the way I have um, uh, come to understand identity politics and, and make a critique of it. Um, I just want to make also a reference to, to the Harvard study. I think these studies are important. They must be uh, addressed. They must be discussed as opposed to in some way uh, retracted. But I think as we all know, um, studies uh, employ devices of framing, right? There's always a frame, there's always a model, there's always a, par uh, a paradigm that um, frames the evidence that's presented. And I think this is really crucial. Uh, to keep in mind. So the, the question of frame is, is, is really key. And this was something I think that was most, noted, uh, most noticeably or, or most importantly um, acknowledged by uh, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant in his Transcendental Idealism, that concepts without intuitions are empty, intuitions without concepts are blind. One has to look at facts and evidence within a larger uh, context and, and framework. And I think that in terms of the indigenous question, to say, you know, um, it's simply about the allies of, of, of these groups um, and uh, um, uh, the traditional governance structures, and this is a kind of politically correct view and so on, I'm not sure is quite right. I, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I would say that um, to leave the, the discussion of two important Supreme Court decisions out of uh, the mix places things in a in a certain kind of light. Again, it's a matter of framing and this will be really um, critical to the argument that uh, I want to make uh, in, uh, come in, in, in just a few minutes. The framing question is also important insofar as this is really where politics can come into play without seeming to come into play. Um, and Stephen Harper knew exactly what he was doing when he warned that this is not the time to commit sociology in the aftermath of um, uh, an indigenous woman's uh, murder, that is Tina Fontaine. And this is part and parcel of what Pam Palmiter has called the question of Canada's state of emergency for indigenous peoples. Uh, the, the, the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous girls and women. This is, uh, um, I think, a, a national scandal that has to be uh, uh, addressed. What Harper was doing in seeking to reduce this to a mere criminal matter was to say, let's not talk about the larger uh, historical and social forces here. And this presents a certain picture of Indigenous communities and the, the, the challenges they face and the conditions that they have been resisting, with the racist implication that it must be some essential or natural quality about them that has led to their predicament, and not the ongoing legacy of colonialism that TRC has meant to address. Um, I see the TRC in the context of the denazification process that happened uh, in West Germany uh, post-World War II. Um, the larger discussion that was spawned by the students' movement uh, from 1967 onward about um, the, the nature of the past and how one comes to terms with the past. It has to do with the TRC in post-apartheid uh, uh, South Africa, also in uh, post-genocide Rwanda. These are ways in which societies can come to terms with deep-seated traumas within them. Uh, and it's one, one thing that, you know, has been quite absent in the United States, I would think. Um, also, I mean, this is something, you know, that Marx was himself very uh, concerned about, the, the colonialism. He wrote a lot about colonialism. He, he wrote a, a lot about slavery in the United States. He talked about India and Ireland. And I, I would suggest here, if people are interested, Kevin Anderson's book, Marx at the Margins. And so Marxist tradition has been very uh, alive to uh, colonialism and the role it plays in the global capitalist order. Um, and I think also I, I enjoyed Joanne's talk very much. Um, and in, indeed, I would agree that uh, uh, civil war and, and the conditions for the possibility of peace are key questions for him. But so is the failure of the, leg the legitimacy of a state that fails to provide for security of the person and commodious living. And I think you could say that what's happening in the United States here is a, a very um, clear sense amongst many communities uh, and not just black and brown, not those that are just directly affected, but many U.S. citizens are, are saying, look, um, the state has not secured these conditions uh, for black and brown communities, right? So there's a, something like uh, a crisis of democratic legitimacy here. I found it extremely, I have to say, and I don't often use this term, but I found it extremely offensive to hear 
that um, tacit defense of the brutality against um, the police brutality against the elderly peaceful protester in Buffalo. And presumably, I guess, the, the group think that prevented one of the um, officers present from going to the protester's aid. We live in a liberal democratic society, don't we? Peaceful process such as this is, uh, is no longer possible. Um, can we defend freedom of, of speech and expression and this kind of brutality against peaceful protest at the same time? I think these are really, really difficult questions, aren't they? So again, uh, I hope this seem, this will uh, become relevant in terms of what I want to say, which is to, uh, let's say, reframe the question of um, both freedom of expression, but especially academic freedom. And that was the reason for my discussion of academic freedom under fire. And this has come up a little bit in the discussion. I appreciate that. Um, in authoritarian populist uh, regimes across uh, the globe. And I, I talk in particular um, about Turkey, about Brazil, India, uh, and Hungary. And this was a context of a discussion of what Viktor Orban, um, a good pal of uh, Stephen Harper, uh, calls illiberal democracy. So I think illiberal democracy is one of the crucial uh, forces that um, uh, undermine academic freedom today. So I'll begin now. Um, yesterday I embarked on a scan of the state of academic freedom globally by looking at academic freedom's relation to freedom of speech, particularly in light of these four populist, authoritarian populist regimes that I just mentioned, that have embarked on a transition towards um, illiberal democracy, in which Donald Trump uh, has enacted uh, with, um, you know, amongst other things, his recent call for the military to be deployed against um, what are largely peaceful uh, protests um, against police violence and racial inequality. In short, this is a conception of politics, um, uh, of, or more precisely, the political, drawn from the existentialism of Carl Schmitt, based on the fundamental opposition and, and antagonism between friend and foe. Illiberal democracy is a form of democracy with fewer checks and balances on the executive branch of government, a branch that purports to represent um, and embody the sovereign will of the people, the better to enable it to confront its enemies from both above, the so-called elites, um, uh, often tacitly understood uh, as the Jews, often very um, explicitly understood in these terms. Viktor Arbon's ongoing um, uh, uh, feud with George Soros, for example, as well as enemies from below, migrants, uh, religious and cultural minorities, um, racialized peoples, and so on. This is important background to keep in mind when, I, when raising the question I want to examine today. Is academic freedom in crisis in Canada? I think on first blush, it is easy to jump to the conclusion that as with free speech, academic freedom is in deep crisis. I've suggested as much in some of my writings over the past couple of years, and Francis has made reference to, um, to one of these. And my focus has been on the way in which identity politics is ultimate, ultimately detrimental to a leftist identity, which I take to be fundamentally about addressing the sources of socioeconomic inequality. And I'm basing some of these, though I'm not speaking uh, for the Institute for Humanities, um, I am basing some of my remarks on observations uh, over a 10-year period. Um, um, uh, when I was, since I uh, became director, as well as serving on the steering committee uh, from some, for some six years prior to that. Some of our events have, have been the source of controversy and provo provoked threats, need for extra security, call, out, call outs on social media, and complaints to upper administration, and even threats to bring matters before boards, the Board of Governors. The Institute is therefore not immune to the growing and larger trends within North American society to police and regulate various forms of speech and expression and representation. Every week, it seems, there is another effort to stifle works of literature, to withdraw offending books from shelves of libraries, to shut down theatrical productions, to remove artworks from exhibitions, and even have them destroyed to cover over murals depicting historical realities of genocide and slavery to have an offending article removed from a journal, and so on. 
explanations of why this is occurring um, as part of uh, a, a more general illiberal turn uh, are uh, complex. And I have some intuitions as to you know, why this is happening, um, but we'll not go into them here. I can provide you with numerous examples of this tendency to add to the ones you've, uh, you're already familiar with and indeed have already uh, discussed and uh, are up on, on, on the, the SAP's website and, and so on. It's part and parcel of what the novelist Sarah Schulman has called the tendency to pathologize conflict, which is to say to equate conflict with abuse. There is little sense today of people being able to separate the identity of the speaker from the speech or that of the writer from the text, the identity of the artist from the artwork. Not only is the content of the production of speech, texts, and artworks limited, so too is the purview of criticism. Right? So the same kind of identity criterion seems to also apply in terms of criticism. Um, all criticism becomes by definition uh, ad hominem by attacking my argument. I feel that you attack me personally or even deny my right to exist. I am in a sense my argument, the solidity of my premises and uh, the groundness, the, the, sorry, the, the, the solidity of my premises, the soundness of my inferences and accuracy of my evidence. Question these and you question me and possibly my very right to exist. In this there is, as Shulman also notes, significant overinflation of harm. As most people here will uh, already know, I think, but one of the classic texts um, uh, that has influenced the way we think about the scope of individual freedom, uh, in particular uh, free, uh, free and freedom of expression, is J.S. Mill's On Liberty, in which he argues that the limit of freedom is the idea of harm to others. And, and um, this idea of harm is itself, uh, I think, quite um, uh, ambiguous and um, slippery. Today, we see a tendency to argue on the basis of these very premises for a limitation of freedom, um, free speech and expression in particular, by overstating or overinflating the harm um, to the point where it equates with, to the point where it equates with views I disagree with. So harm, harmful um, are those views that, that I uh, disagree with or find offensive. The overinflation uh, of harm is deeply, it's, is itself deeply harmful, both to civil society in general and the university in particular, it is often most harmful to the groups it is supposedly meant to protect. And I think the best example of this is the targeting by customs officials of the queer bookshop in Vancouver, and this was in the 1980s, called Little Sisters Books. Um, and it was precisely the, the legislation made possible um, in part or contributed to uh, in part by um, the ideas of Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin that made this so. I think the roots of this view have to do with at least three developments. The, important, um, the importance of the concept of recognition, which in the modern period can be traced to the um, work of figures such as Rousseau, Hegel, Marx, Fanon, and has more recently been elaborated in liberal terms uh, by philosophers such as Charles Taylor and Axel Honneth. There are also the feminist debates on the nature uh, and harmful effects of uh, pornography. Um, and again, I refer back to the work of Catherine McKinnon, uh, for whom uh, the depiction of rape is no different from the act itself. And both of these, you could say, um, come to a head with the notorious fatwa against Salman Rushdie um, in the late uh, 1980s, um, whose satanic verses was held by some to have been deeply damaging and hurtful to the global Muslim community. Though, of course, the event was stage managed and, and uh, um, thoroughly and cynically manipulated by, um, uh, by Tehran. Now, yesterday I suggested that freedom must be understood within the context of the dynamics of recognition that constitute what Hegel calls. Uh, ethical life. Freedom is never a kind of natural right, but is fundamentally historically emergent and socially bounded. It is a result of struggles uh, for recognition. This is why there are and always will be debates on the nature and limits of freedom, including academic freedom and free speech. There is no such thing as an absolute freedom of speech or expression. The claim that there is or can be uh, is often very destructive. 
But this becomes fraught when the harm um, of non or misrecognition recognition becomes exaggerated. The, the debate about how a, an open society ought to be uh, and under which conditions, um, sorry, the debate about how open a society ought to be and under what, which conditions must paradoxically itself be left as open as, as possible. Given that freedom of speech is necessary, is, the, is a necessary though not sufficient condition for reasonable disagreement, and given that such reasonable disagreement is intrinsic to the life of the mind in general and the universe in particular, it would appear that the broader tendencies within society uh, that are increasingly inhospitable to free speech and expression will spill over into and affect the university and ultimately be equally um, inhospitable to academic freedom. And this is how I think we can understand the increasing re request on the part of students and equity offices lobbying uh, on their behalf for such things as trigger or content warnings, um, uh, safe spaces for black, indigenous, uh, uh, and, and people of color, and the like. Um, and it does appear that these demands demonstrate an unwillingness to engage with ideas that students may disagree with. This is often couched in terms of an unwillingness to expend emotional labor in debate and discussion. Many examples here uh, could be uh, adduced, um, but the one that sticks out for me is uh, Laura Kipnis's uh, offer um, upon having had her, well, upon seeing there being um, a, a kind of groundswell of opposition to her appearing at, uh, um, I think it's uh, uh, Wesley College, um, to give a talk about uh, her book, Unwanted Advances. She offered to um, have, a, have a small discussion with the students who had problems with her, uh, her arguments or, or just the fact of her book. And um, faculty on, on behalf of the students said that they shouldn't have to expend such emotional labor and have a discussion with her. I, if we can't have these discussions in the university, then then we're in trouble. And and so th there's that dimension of the work that SAFS does that that, um, that I'm sympathetic to, without a doubt. And I think that it it, it hasn't always been like this. You you can recall um, the uh, phenomenal debate uh, that James Baldwin had with William F. Buckley at the Oxford Student Union, um, and also uh, the quite extraordinary discussion. Uh, that Huey P. Newton, um, one of the founders of the Black Panthers Party, had with the same William F. Buckley Jr. on firing line in, in January 1973. Uh, again, also refer back to the Frankfurt School and their willingness to engage with their opponents and, you know, very often hostile opponents. But there has to be um, an exchange of, uh, of, of viewpoints and there shouldn't be a kind of tendency to um, uh, to shield against this. And indeed, this does contribute to a chilling climate for the exercise of academic freedom. However, as I suggested yesterday, both free speech and academic freedom themselves entail limitations. We're not simply researchers, but also teachers, and as such, we have a duty of care to our students and should strive to create environments in our classrooms that are welcoming for all students, so they can have their um, views set forth and heard and be responded to. I think we're becoming especially aware in this historical moment of the nature of, or at least some, some of us are, some of us are becoming uh, aware uh, in this historical uh, moment of the nature of socioeconomic inequalities and how this impacts different communities, in particular black, brown and indigenous communities. So this question of safety is a complex one and ought not to be overinflated nor ought it to simply be dismissed out of hand. I hope at least that there would be broad agreement that in order to be professional teachers and indeed good citizens of the university community as a whole, we need to be deeply sensitive and attentive to their needs, as we would indeed to um, the needs of newly arrived Syrian Kurdish uh, refugee students. Each of these groups carries considerable traumas within them, uh, and if we're not attentive to this, I doubt we can discharge our professional responsibilities as teachers adequately. At the same time, I would say that the overstatement of harm and the overuse of the word trauma tends to elide the experiences of those who have suffered most deeply. 
logically speaking, if everyone is traumatized, then no one is traumatized. For example, a couple of years ago at the University of Ottawa, a white yoga teacher was ultimately forced to give up teaching uh, a yoga course um, to a group of disabled students out of a concern um, uh, for cultural appropriation. In spite of Ottawa area South Asian yoga teachers having expressed no um, uh, worries whatsoever about this about this practice. So what we have here is not only an inflated or imaginary claim of harm that produces actual and demonstrable harm to um, the group of disabled question, the group of disabled students in question, a group that could no longer avail itself of regular and one assumes physically, psychologically beneficial yoga practice. I think this, in my example, uh, the example I would, I, I would give of um, uh, mixed race students who have been um, expelled from uh, uh, supposedly safe spaces for uh, black, uh, indigenous, uh, and, and uh, students of color is, is also illustrative and, and worth taking seriously that often well intentioned equity seeking policies can backfire and end up doing more damage than good to the very groups that they are meant to help. The path to heaven is paved with good intentions. And must, one might, must also, I think, mention a certain tendency to um, misrepresent the facts of the matter, uh, as was the case um, uh, a couple of years back at Wilfrid Laurier. Um, there's also, of course, and in, in, in the this, in this same um, uh, category, I would place uh, the case of Rebecca Tuval that uh, we discussed uh, last week. Um, there are also other cases of, um, of students, uh, sorry, of professors losing their particular positions or roles, functions within the university. Um, you know, the case of James Potter. Um, there's more, more recently the case of uh, gender critical feminist at the University of Alberta, um, anthropologist Kath, Kathleen uh, Lowry, that um, uh, I think there, a letter just went up uh, last night. Uh, Mark was telling us, telling uh, us about this in, the, in, in his introductions. There's also the example of Ronald Sullivan uh, at Harvard um, University, Harvard's first black dean who lost his position because of uproar on being um, uh, part of uh, Harvey Weinstein's uh, legal team. Uh, the fact that uh, Henry Kissinger, somebody who uh, Christopher Hitchens, um, once called a war criminal, could remain in this position at, for, for many years at, at the JFK, JFK School of Government at Harvard unmolested, I think is, is also quite interesting. So who gets targeted for, uh, for what? So it seemed, given the plethora of examples, um, which I would, of course, also add uh, um, those listed on the SAS uh, web, website uh, as well, freedom of speech and expression more generally, uh, and um, academic freedom in particular, seem, you know, it is in deep crisis in the context of what is uh, sometimes referred to as council culture. So what I'm saying is, look, we, we do seem to have uh, many examples in a kind of um, growing uh, uh, atmosphere that's inhospitable to um, academic freedom. And much ink is spilt in the pages of the National Post, the Global Mail, Quillette magazine, and so on. Uh, bemoaning this, the destruction of free speech and ac academic freedom on college campuses, according to Jonathan um, Haidt, uh, who, who was referred to earlier, this leads to uh, what he calls the coddling of the American mind. The evidence, therefore, seems overwhelming, then, doesn't it, that what we um, have is uh, a rather serious crisis of academic freedom because of political correctness run amok. I would agree that, the, that this state of affairs militates against some of the spirit of rational, um, open, and, and critical inquiry that is the condition for the possibility of scholarly and scientific work within and beyond the university. Uh, as Karl Popper puts it, um, the work of critical inquiry uh, in, in science in particular, but you know, more generally, proceeds through a dialectic of conjecture and refutation. These examples do threaten academic freedom, and this tendency certainly is something that uh, organizations um, such as SAFs and various faculty uh, associations and universities, provi provincial and uh, national organizations like COT, um, must keep a very uh, close eye on. However, 
and this is a point I want to explore in the remainder of my talk, I would really be loath to say that this represents the worst threat to academic freedom. And I think this is the larger context which in, within which the discussion of academic freedom must happen. So not, not just the global context that I referred to yesterday, but in the North American context, there's something else that needs to come into the frame and needs to be part of the discussion in a more, let's say, fulsome way than, than what I've heard so far. Uh, to be quite uh, to be quite frank, consider for example a recent article in Reason magazine dated September nineteenth, twenty nineteen, which, citing a recent fire report, indicates that in recent years the threat to ac academic freedom from the so-called left has in part receded. The author's article, um, Shika Dalmia, states that the fire report, and I'll quote here at some length, so please bear with me found that the percentage of institutions with speech codes that clearly and sub substantially restrict freedom of speech, a genuine problem in the 1990s, had diminished by 42 percentage points since 2009 in the, in the sample it surveyed. Even better, 37 universities earned its green light uh, rating for having no speech codes whatsoever, compared to uh, merely eight in 2009. Meanwhile, 27 schools or faculty bodies embraced um, University of Chicago's widely praised free speech principles up from seven uh, the year uh, before. The principles affirm the university's commitment to stand firm against disinvitation of controversial speakers or the disruption of events. A more serious threat the author alleges is from a right increasingly emboldened and backed by growing conservative um, media and more disturbing state power okay and i'm going to quote again conservatives warn day and night about liberal political correctness but give scarcely a thought to how their own brand of patriotic correctness stifles free expression if they did they wouldn't be instigating anti-flag burning amendments on a regular basis and they certainly wouldn't have stood squarely behind this president when he berated the 49ers quarterback uh, Colin Kaepernick for kneeling during the national anthem to protest police brutality and demanded that the NFL fire him. In addition, Dalmia shows a wide array of tactics, including concerted and aggressive social media um, campaign against leftist pr professors instigated by far right media outlets. Republican politicians are then quick to get involved and put pressure um, for further action. In a particularly germane and timely example, the University of Alabama fired James R. Riley, who is black, from his position as VP and Dean of Students because of his criticism of the US flag, and more importantly and urgently, for his criticism of police racism. This came to light after the um, alt-right media site, formerly edited by neo-fascist Steve Bannon, Breitbart, exposed his tweets. So here is a counterexample to some of the discussion earlier. Right. This is somebody who stood up and, and spoke out against police brutality, who, who criticized the flag. And for that, uh, he um, was fired. Of course, there are the notorious examples of uh, George Chikorio uh, Marr and uh, Stephen Salaita. I, I won't go into those um, cases uh, now. I, I'm, I'm assuming people are familiar with them. We can come back to them later if we need to. So while there are clearly problems with the left's tendency to overinflate concepts of harm and trauma, the real threat, in my opinion, does not reside there. Arguably a one-sided focus and uh, sensationalism, particularly by conservative press of a political correctness run amok under the guise of an imaginary cultural Marxism is actually a much more serious threat to both free speech and expression and academic freedom. The cure, in other words, is much worse than the disease. It responds as well to the larger anti-elitist and anti-intellectual forces of populism that have, threat, uh, who, that have swept through um, our societies in the past decades. As Trump's statement makes clear, I love the uneducated. The real threat to academic freedom, I would suggest, has to do then less with the coddling of the American mind, let's say the North American mind, then with the growing spread and pervasiveness of illiberal democracy, which is itself a response to decades of 
neoliberal reform. It may seem that such illiberal democracy seeks to address and reverse attacks on free speech within civil society and academic freedom within the university, but this could not be farther from the truth. If it seeks to engage in such reversals, it is only uh, a matter of rhetoric rather than real action. Uh, and we saw a certain movement, and I'm glad this was referenced in terms of the damage done uh, to NSERC by the Harper government. I, I'm really pleased that that came into the discussion because I think this is part and parcel of what I want to talk about. Um, we saw a movement in the direction towards illiberal, illiberal democracy uh, in the government of Stephen Harper, again, a, a very good friend uh, and admirer of Viktor Orban. All the hallmarks of illiberal democracy were present in this government, including open battles with uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the use of massive omnibus bills um, uh, to pass unpopular legislation with minimal legislative scrutiny. There was also the passage of Bill C-51, uh, the Anti-Terror Act, which according to um, uh, virtually all legal experts that were consulted, uh, former uh, or retired uh, Supreme Court justices and former prime ministers represented a significant threat to civil liberties um, and uh, possibly also was in violation of the, the, uh, the Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms. It criminalized dissent uh, and um, in particular in, in terms of it, it, it ta its targeting of opposition to major infrastructure projects. I think one can read between the lines here and say this was a targeting of indigenous uh, 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 forms of, of resistance. Anticipating Bolsonaro's UN speech that I referred to yesterday, decrying the outside interference of NGOs, Parker's uh, environment minister um, decried a similar influence um, in the uh, growing opposition to the uh, tar sands. So much for uh, a free exchange of ideas. As for academic freedom implications, the Harper government pulled funding for basic scientific research, stating that it was only interested in funding research with direct practical applications. Harper stated that, um, and I mentioned the, the um, injunction not to commit sociology. There was the interference, a direct interference with the SHRC in the conference at York that uh, was the subject then of a major uh, COT uh, study and, and a book, and I can refer people to, to that. Uh, as well. Um, more, moreover, the Harper government muzzled federal government scientists and librarians by preventing them from communicating their findings to the very public whose tax dollars funded their research. Um, so no public uh, communications without prior authorization from the PMO. Let's not kid ourselves um, that this is confined to the conservative party uh, or conservative governments. Recently, the Institute, in fact, was one of the co-sponsors of uh, Antonio Negri, um, who has been a, a very important commentator on the state of globalization, um, to come and speak uh, both in Vancouver and other parts of the country. His um, visa was uh, rejected, his visa application was rejected by the Trudeau Liberals. And also, um, Justin Trudeau made a, a, a big deal of uh, wanting to uh, amend the anti-terror legislation he uh, has not uh, done so. The threat to academic freedom has to do not only with authoritarian governments, but also the structural transformation of the university, often referred to as corporatization. And this was raised by Steve earlier, um, and I think this is a really crucial point. I think this is the, the most important point, in fact. And, and, you know, this is typically left out of the most of the, uh, or all of the sensationalized reportage, the op-ed pieces and so on about how political correctness constitutes a, a clear and present danger to free speech and ac academic freedom. And I think this is really, uh, really crucial. I have to ask myself, why is this the case? Why does this fall out of the discussion when it seems to me that it structurally is the key question? And I'd go on, I'm nearly finished, and then we can uh, open it up for discussion. And so I just cite the way in which um, massive educational reforms were undertaken by the Thatcher government in the, the uh, 1980s, especially with the 1988 Education Reform Bill, which basically got rid of tenure and it subjected the university to um, uh, competitive market forces. But I think if you ask our colleagues in British universities the statement, you know, um, ha you know the, the proposition that this has been a good thing for research and teaching in British 
uh, universities. Um, I, my, my hypothesis is that most would say it has not um, been a, a very good thing uh, at all. And, and then more recently, the Conservative government, uh, I think it was, uh, I think it was before David Cameron, um, but there was something like a 90% uh, reduction of funding to social sciences and humanities. Uh, in Canada, we see a steady decline in transfer payments for higher education. For example, um, in 1992, the cash transfer was equivalent to 0 0.41 of GDP. In 2014-2015, it was reduced to 0 0.2. 20%. Uh, um, uh, this is a reduction of, uh, of a little over 50%, and is certainly posed now, poised now to get much worse as a result of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. You only have to look at the Manitoba government and where it's, it's heading in terms of modeling up to 30% um, budget cuts in, um, uh, for Manitoban um, universities and, and uh, colleges. I will just now come. So uh, in other instances of the cure being much worse in the disease are the Canadian versions that we see, um, that we've seen already uh, in Brazil and the United States. And the United States wishes to say advocacy of blacklists for cultural Marxists, um, or in, you know, in, in the language of Jordan Peterson, the postmodern neo-Marxist cult. Um, professors who can be named and shamed. Uh, and an early version of this, uh, I found, uh, you know, was in an article from the 1990s, which cites the, the notion of velvet totalitarianism introduced by Professor Ferretti. Um, and this was a list of Canada's uh, nuttiest professors. Of course, you know, the, the press is free to do as it likes. Um, however, let us not pretend that such germ journalism understands, respects, or helps to uphold the principle of academic freedom. Uh, Jordan Peterson has gone so far as to argue that entire units uh, within universities, including schools of law, be summarily eliminated. Again, these attempted defenses of, of free speech and, ac and academic freedom are emphatically nothing of the sort. They're um, a matter of, you know, free speech and academic freedom for the views that I agree with. And that's not a principled defense uh, by any sense of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the word. Um, of uh, academic freedom or uh, free speech. Steadily uh, decreasing transfer payments from Ottawa to the provinces have been made up with um, by tuition increases and through increasing reliance on, on alumni and donor, uh, corporate donors. Um, with this increasing reliance on private funding comes heightened sensitivity to external pressures, right? He who pays the piper calls the tune. Corporatization of the university, as any number of books and, and studies uh, have shown, um, leads to administrative bloat and what uh, Benjamin Ginsburg calls the fall of the faculty and the rise of the administration. These developments have created an academic underclass, also of adjunct faculty, the so-called precariat, with poor salaries, uh, few if any benefits, and no job security. Um, and these developments uh, are nicely summed up by my colleague and friend uh, Ian Angus in his book, Love the Question, um, and I highly recommend it. It's called Love the Questions, University um, uh, um, Questions and Enlightenment, and uh, I hope people can look at that. I was going to cite it, but I'm, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to conclude. As the university relies increasingly on ever more powerful administrative bureaucracies and ever uh, more powerless teaching uh, staff, Academic freedom becomes perilous indeed. While the statements on academic freedom referred to yesterday assert the principle that all members of the uh, university community possess uh, academic freedom, this is not really the case in reality. The real protection of academic freedom lies with tenure. It is with tenure that enables professors to research and teach unpopular, controversial subjects unhindered, that is, without fear of reprisals in the form of uh, job loss or demotion. With, with tenure structurally on the decline, it is certain that academic freedom will follow suit. Given that academic freedom is a core principle of the university, if academic freedom and the self-governance it entails disappears, so uh, will the university as we know it. Um, I'll just give you some, some figures on where this is heading, and then I will, uh, I'll stop, um, and then I'll kind of get over. Um, so the long term uh, of reduced funding, funding to post-secondary institutions is entailed, among other things, um, a drastic and uh, continuing reduction of tenure track and tenured 
uh, faculty in relation uh, to adjunct faculty throughout North America. A 2010 report released by the U.S. Department of Education shows a drastic reduction from 57% in 1971 to 30% in 2009. In Canada, tenured faculty dropped um, to 20,685 from uh, 1999 to, uh, oh, I don't have that figure, sorry. Um, I've got, I, I have to check that figure. But the, 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 the decline of tenured faculty in, um, in Canada has mirrored this, the same kind of trend that we uh, see in uh, the United States. So just to conclude, uh, while I think that um, these, the question of the impingement of kind of cancel culture on the university has a certain chilling effect on academic freedom, I think the real threat to academic freedom lies in some of these larger structural transformations, the corporatization of the university, the fall of the faculty, the rise of the administration, uh, and, and ultimately um, the decline of tenured faculty and the reliance on precarious uh, and vulnerable um, uh, professors. Um, I think that really needs to come into the picture much more than it has in the discussions that I've seen so far. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Samir. Uh, we have a few questions uh, to, to go through. Um, the first one will be from Joanne, if she would like to come on. Oh, I got to do that video thing. Hey, Sam. Uh, good talk. I, but I wonder if, actually, um, this is how I think about it. You're sort of counterposing the left critique, the right critique of blah 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 and then you sort of identify corporatization and it, and sort of incursions by the state on academic freedom and universities fair enough that's what you're saying but it seems to me actually the point is and i don't think this is talked about enough in terms of a critique of identity politics it's precisely that that's the source of the bureaucratization the administrative bloat the material interest of faculty to make arguments to shirk about the latest groovy topic. There are bloated HR departments. There are, and give them, give them a, like I was said in my talk, give them beauty bias. They'll go for it. We'll set up six beauty bias officers and that'll be the new thing. That's where a lot of the administrative bloat and the corporatization comes from. And connected to that, if you think about identity politics in the bigger world, what is gay pride? It's now a corporate festival. In other words, identity politics are literally becoming an industry. And I think within the university, we don't talk about that economic aspect of it enough. It's literally in people's material interest. It isn't just a psychological glitch. It's because if you apply to shirt, you know which four topics, you know it. And you also know if you have particular skin color, you know you're in the game. So it's a materially driven thing. I don't think it's just psychological. Uh, so in that sense, I think you're actually, the two pieces can possibly be put together. I think there's probably lots of differences in terms of ideology and so forth, but actually that's precisely the problem. And just to make one last point, and what strikes me too with social movements and all the identity politics, gay rights, trans rights, women's rights, indigenous rights. What is striking about this, because of this bureaucratic bloat and, and institutionalized governing of diversity, you basically have lost movements from below and people just look to the state to fix it. And I think that's where a lot of the calls from censor for censorship come from. It may be that you have a grassroots movement, grassroots movement, and then there's sort of competition among ideas, and then you sort of figure out how to do it in a community and so forth. But the impulse is to ask the state, the faculty union, the uh, administration to do it for you. And I think that's actually just a, a, it's kind of a root of the problem. There's actually strangely a kind of passivity in all of this. It's like, fix it for me, fire the professor, don't hurt my feelings, but you're asking a governing body of HR reps and so on to do it for you. 
as opposed to student groups having congregations. Do you know what I mean? Like sort of grassroots student movements doing it for themselves and so on and so forth. Um, the, and just to connect it to one thing I've seen, and I have seen zero, uh, very little discussion of this with this COVID crisis. It's kind of, it's a kind of weird paradox, which is that essentially the faculty have completely accepted directives from the state, from the federal government, provincial governments that we shut down. I have not seen any serious discussion of this. Faculty unions have fallen in line. And do you know what this means? You can talk about corporatization all you want. Zoom is making billions of dollars as we speak. Google's going to do well. They're going to basically make deals with universities. Uh, Amazon is going to sell you all your books to your students. They are going to up enrollment while we sit here like freaking machines talking on a computer. It's outrageous. I am, I cannot believe no one's talked about this. Basically, billionaires are just stuffing money in their pockets from this COVID pandemic in quotes. I'm sorry, Neil Ferguson, they should all be fired and whatever. They were wrong. And there's no evidence. Here in Manitoba, there have been seven deaths. And I can't go and teach my students in a liberal arts university in September because there's going to be a second wave. Give me a break. At minimum, maybe I'm wrong. Give me the evidence. Let's debate it. So I just cannot believe this. So talk about corporatization. It's over. We basically okay. handed power. We're done. We're done. That's what I think. Sorry, I'm mad about I, this. <laughs> I, I, I love your passion, Joanne. I, I've had some of the same, yeah. uh, the same questions, but uh, maybe Samira could, could speak to that before we move to the next, uh, the next person. No, uh, with pleasure. I think those are um, excellent, uh, both a question and a, and a kind of intervention. Uh, so yes, um, I think in, in some of the best critiques of, of identity politics, and I, I mean here uh, Adolf Reed Jr., for example, you, you see um, the presentation, or what he does is he presents identity politics as a kind of uh, ideology of the, the uh, managerial class uh, within neoliberalism. And we see this also, um, you know, it, it, so in the, the larger corporate world, but we also see it in the university. Um, the university is increasingly, because it, it, of its um, uh, corporate identity, um, it is very invested in its brand. That's now, right. the effect of the brand will, will be then detrimental to its ability to uh, operate within, within the market. And so it's, it, it's extremely concerned about this. And I think this is a, it's sort of cynical response. There's some, some real you know, some real needs on the part of, of students and some faculty and, and, and so on. Um, but you're absolutely right. Unlike the 60s, where there was, a, you know, uh, an attempt to be active and, and to confront the administration um, uh, directly and, and on the students' terms, now it's, you know, it, it's a matter of saying, you know, please help us. We have these problems and you need to solve them. You need to go uh, after the professor. When, when in fact, Progressive professors should actually be in uh, in in uh, in league with their students, but but this is a way in which the administration can have more power over uh, professors uh, as well. And I think this comes out in the report um, uh, in is, it, is it University Affairs or the report about the University of Alberta professor, where there's a direct uh, suggestion that the university has to balance academic freedom and the needs of the students. Well, no, hold on. Uh, and that can, that's different from what I said. I said, we need to be aware of how we relate to our students. But if, our, if the administration now says, you have to be balancing academic freedom with these other heteronymous uh, uh, questions, well, that's a different uh, story. And I do think the fact that the associations have a role to play here. Now, the COVID thing, you know, the extreme statement on this was, of course, um, uh, Giorgio Agamben, uh, who said that those faculty who fall in line are very much like the German faculty who signed the loyalty pledge in 1931, right? That's over the top. But I agree that we do need to see this. If it's a temporary, it, this, is, this has got to be understood as an exceptional and temporary measure. And we need to back into the real physical classrooms as soon as possible. Otherwise, it, it will be it's over. over. It'll be over. It'll be Amazon U and Google U and, and, and uh, 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 Microsoft U. So, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you on that. Thanks, John.
<laughs> okay, the next uh, speaker is Francis. Uh, if you wanted to ask your question, please try to keep it succinct, although I know uh, a lot of these back and forths are very interesting. We'll try to get through uh, as many questions as we can. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robert. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Um, thanks, Samir. I, I really, I, I think, think that was a very interesting talk, and I, I do agree uh, that, uh, and I agree with Joanne, I, I, I think we're dealing with things that are kind of interconnected, and I actually think that's where the diversity managerialism um, kind of literature comes into it, because it's arguing that, you know, who's really in favor of diversity? It's you know, it's not, it is all these corporate interests and everything that are, so you've got banks who are, you know, they're saying hooray for diversity and so on. So, um, uh, but anyway, I, I think that's, that's a very, I think that has to always be kept in mind. Uh, my, uh, I just wanted to draw your attention to something I was, I was hoping to, to talk about in my introduction, but I forgot, um, which is, um, you know, the, the use of academic freedom and freedom of expression, not in a principled way, but as a weapon, as an ideological weapon. And whenever I talk to people about this, I always, I'm very concerned because I really think that the defense of these things in a principled way, which means that you will defend Ricardo Duchenne just the way you will defend Norman Finkelstein and all the all these different kinds of issues you, you want to defend all of them not just the ones that you agree with and I think that is a serious problem and we always have to be you know fighting the fight for the free expression of ideas the the pursuit of truth and so on not just going after, you know, you know, standing behind the people that we agree with. So uh, that's just what I wanted to add to the conversation. Thanks. Did you want to speak to that, Samir, or do we, do you want me to move to the next person? We can move on. Okay. So the next uh, speaker is uh, Sink. Uh, with his question, Sick McRae. Thanks, Robert, and thanks, Samir, for a very interesting talk. Is the audio okay on my uh, on my uh, feed here? Okay, great. So uh, uh, it's going to take me a moment to uh, to pull together my my challenge, actually, uh, for for your argument, Samir. I, I I think of one of the values of the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship as a procedural or methodological one, which is that in a context in which people can engage in principled dissent and, uh, and uh, a free exchange of ideas, uh, something good will come out of that. So I, I agree with that, actually. And given that, I think that framing the debate about academic freedom in terms of the political spe spectrum, in, in a way, kind of misses the point. So the deeper issue, I think, is that both on the left and on the right, there are forces of anti-rationalism in our society. And by rationalism, I'm not talking about the historical view and epistemology, but the idea of the uh, disparagement or poor use of reason. Uh, to that end, uh, here's the challenge that I have for, for, your, for your argument. So is academic freedom under attack? The argument that you, was mostly an overview, but also you were, I think, uh, defending academic freedom, presupposes that it's something that should be defended. So here's the sort of the contrarian skeptical response. Uh, if we think of the, that, the value of academic freedom in terms of uh, the rights that we have, it corresponds with responsibilities we have as well. So I think of the professionalization of many different kinds of occupations, including faculty as well. So one of the things that we have in the university, one thing that concerns me quite a bit actually, are anti-rationalist forces among the prof professoriate. So in that context, we have, a, we have both a compact or a, an agreement with society that will exercise academic freedom responsibly. And we're also self-governing. So to what extent do you think academic freedom should be curtailed insofar as elements of uh, faculty uh, engage in anti-rationalist uh, 
various forms of anti-rationalism. I'll, I'll stop there and, and let you respond. Thanks so much. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, could I just ask for a clarification? Um, could you give me an example of what you understand by anti-rationalism? Yeah, so one of the things that I think that, sorry, I should turn my camera back on. One of the things that I think that uh, the group uh, SAFs is opposed to is the efforts to shut down or to, here, I'll, actually I'll, I'll frame it back in terms of the idea of tenure. So tenure is something that we grant in a way to protect academic freedom in the university setting. Um, I've experienced, and this is obviously anecdotal, cases in which people shut down discussion. So I understand there's an interesting argument by Levy uh, that people need safe spaces in the university in order to get their work done, right? So I don't want to constantly be explaining my metaphysical beliefs to people who ask me, do you really think there's no such thing as causality? I have to get my work done. But when we're talking about questions about justice, this is cross-disciplinary. So I've experienced occasions where people just aren't interested in talking about uh, the assumptions that they make in their work or their arguments for their work. And you can see as this grows that there's a possibility that groups will form that will gain enough power to enable to validate their own positions without truly welcoming any kind of dissent. Um, so that's what I'm talking about. Oh, excellent. So. Um a condition of the kind of rationality that you uh, uh, point to is, I think, what I what I was suggesting and defining in in my talk, which was, you know, the Popperian idea of, of conjecture and, and refutation. You know, it, which by definition builds in dissent and builds in conflicting ideas. Um, and I think that that is ab absolutely um, crucial to. Uh, to the, the, the proper exercise of academic freedom. Now, can we limit it to those who don't think that it's important? Can we limit academic freedom in a sense? You know, um, I think that's a good question. And, and the way I would go about answering it is to say, look, you know, the, the conjecture and refutation, uh, scientific method more generally, is, is a procedure, right? It's a procedure by which truth claims are 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 made and and and, and adjudicated uh, and that procedure is not unlike the kind of procedure that governs life in the university right um if i make a claim in a, in a department meeting um i have to back that claim up uh with rationale evidence reasons i can't just say things willy-nilly and expect people to accept them without any further discussion right so i think we're committing ourselves uh both in our work in our teaching and let's say our service in terms of the committees we sit on um, to a certain idea of procedural rationality and then also you'd say procedural justice is entailed in this too uh, and i think that that's important but i think what other groups are trying to do is say look there's a larger context for those procedures and i think that's that's uh legitimate but it's not legitimate for certain claims to completely over uh ride or overwhelm um the, uh, the the procedures that i was just talking about which is to say a certain understanding of rationality boiling down to the giving and taking of reasons uh and arguments so i'm, I'm committed to that that is the life of the university in a nutshell and that's why these arguments about you know not needing to do the emotional labor to engage with arguments that cannot be permitted to wash within the university it's inimical to what a university is about. It's inimical to the idea of, uh, of uh, free in in inquiry and the pursuit of truth. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, just really quickly a, a follow-up. I know other people are waiting. So I, I genuinely do struggle with this because I also study professional ethics and examine the roles in which other professional bodies uh, serve to limit the influence of the oversight of society. And I genuinely do wonder, like, this is a real puzzle for me. How, how, what, as an academic, what steps should we endorse to counter forces that prevent the legitimate oversight of the fair processing of academic work? So what I see happening is in science, there's that, you know, the sort of the this point about disconfirmation and this argument from Popper uh, that 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 really does ground uh, 
a method in the appeal to evidence, but in other areas, like I'm in the humanities, uh, things are a little bit more dicey and there really is room. So you could see, well, that's why postmodernism got going. Uh, there's room for real dissent about, about values, but I, I just raising this as an issue, I, I just find it very difficult to determine, apart from us becoming better professionals and, and governing our own work, I find it really difficult to identify how we could uh, endorse societal oversight of academic administration. And I mean, by, by what, 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 what professors do, I'll stop there. Thanks again. Thank you very much. If I could just quickly respond, it, it was in my talk, but I didn't get to it. And that is that this is why the, you know, why I said the, the cure is, is, is worse than in disease. Um, the, the Ford government's attempts to, well, I mean, the, the, you know, the mandating of free speech um, it, it, protections in the university, um, it, it, this is very problematic precisely because it impinges upon a key dimension of academic freedom, which is to say institutional autonomy and self-governance. So that also enters into the discussion here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sink. Uh, Henry is the next uh, speaker, if you wanted to ask his question. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, first, uh, yes, I would like to agree about the COVID uh, situation and uh, was similar. Um, I tried to uh, discuss things with people, but there was no ability. Uh, it was just totally shut down. Um, they made a decision and that was it. Nobody could talk about it. Um, now, uh, Francis started out uh, this, this session saying that uh, there are two sides and we should listen to two sides. And I must admit that uh, Samir definitely is on the other side of, of, of but all the issues that I heard today from the side that I'm on. Um, <clears throat> in particular, one of the things uh, that, that came up was uh, his comment about the police and mostly peaceful marchers. And that's a quote. And uh, so this quote being, brings to mind to me a recent quote of Biden, who's running for president in the US, who said, we believe in truth over facts. And I think a lot of, a lot of your talk was, had this type of situation. I think if, if, if you believe that this was mostly peaceful marchers, then you haven't seen the streets of Minneapolis or the streets of New York City, which are so decimated, it's, it's, an, it's just, there's nothing left, or the streets of Los Angeles. And in fact, uh, this doesn't come up in the press, but in some places, I mean, they're calling Los Angeles a pogrom because the synagogues and all the Jewish businesses were particularly targeted and destroyed. Almost every Jewish business in Los Angeles was, was totally destroyed. Um, this is anything but, I think, a, a peaceful, peaceful marchers. And this again goes for the same thing with the, with the police in Buffalo. If this was, the police were, in my opinion, if, if they did something wrong, they should be prosecuted. And not all policemen are good people, I admit, I'm sure that that's the case. They're a cross section of of, uh, of society, but they do have a right to protect themselves. And uh, I think this brings to mind the uh, talk that we had today about Hobbes. And I think that looting, destroying other people's property, and murdering policemen leads to destruction of society. And ends up that society is going to be led by criminals. I think this is the lesson from the first talk about Hobbes. Um, I think, uh, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to go on about many of the other things I, I really disagreed with in your talk, but uh, I think this is the thing I, I disagreed with most. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, I think that there have been many cases, and I think most symbolically represented 
by the police uh, uh, pushing this elderly man uh, onto the ground. He's bleeding from the head. It's unconscious. Um, it's symbolic, you know, it also of, of the, uh, the, the homeless guy in the wheelchair who was hit by a rubber bullet in the face. These are examples of the way in which the police have been out of control and have actually provoked a lot of the uh, violence that has followed. I, I'm not saying there hasn't been massive st civil uh, disturbance and property damage. But I think a lot of this has been provoked by the police. A lot of it, as well as, I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's anger and upset. And as Martin Luther King said, you know, a, a riot is a language of the unheard. Uh, and when there's over and over and over again, the, 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 the execution of innocent people, innocent black people, black men in particular, you're going to have a lot of uh, anger. And that led me to, uh, to, to make my Hobbesian point, which was that the state could no longer, in the eyes of these communities, black and brown communities, is said to create conditions of the social contract, which is to say securing uh, uh, the, 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 the life of the person. And so anyway, I think we, we're going to just have to disagree on this question. Yeah, uh, I like, think this again is truth over facts. If you go and look in this week's uh, Wall Street Journal, there's an article by Heather McDonald, and she goes through and looks at the statistics about police violence against blacks. And it's significantly decreased over the last few years. Um, I, I just wanted to, not, not to interrupt, but we, we have a few questions that we're still gonna go through, so if it's okay, I just wondering if we could move to Bill and uh, he will uh, give his uh, question for Samir. Try to keep it uh, distinct. Who is this, you know, Phil Sullivan you're referring to? Hi, um, I'll, I'll try to make this a telegram rather than a, uh, a monologue. Uh, the first line of the telegram is I've uh, deeply enjoyed the diversity of ideas expressed all day today, uh, and I can only reflect with sadness that in four decades at a major uh, all-purpose university, I've almost never heard uh, debates like this. Um, we've heard uh, a focus on um, uh, problems with freedom of expression, freedom of academic inquiry. And I see the debate uh, is largely actually a matter of consensus. Uh, people have talked about the threat from the right, the threat from the left, the threat, the threat from SHRC, the threat from NSERC, the threat, threat from corporations and the threat from governments. Uh, but largely this has been a matter of consensus and the weighting parameters are, are what is in dispute, uh, at least from uh, the 30,000 foot view. What I think was a little bit missing from the discussion uh, was what I would characterize as the self-corporatization of universities. Uh, universities uh, are no longer, in my experience, uh, and haven't for years, been led by people uh, who rise from the professorate in general. Uh, they're no longer led by people uh, who have any sense of any of the things we've talked about uh, in terms of a search for the truth uh, and any parameter of freedom of expression. Um, and they treat, and this is very important, uh, probably the, the fulcrum for self-corporatization uh, is treating students as customers. Uh, and of course, as we know, the customer is always right. So we routinely have tenure decisions, for example, based upon student evaluation, uh, student opinion. Um, student opinion has to come into it. I'm a child of the 60s. <laughs> I strongly believe in student opinion. But students are probably not in a great position to tell me uh, whether my expertise is current uh, or whether my jokes are good. Uh, so I think we need to look at yet another, God forbid I use the term, root cause. Uh, I think the universities have turned themselves into corporations. Uh, their stockholders are students. Uh, and that is at least as dangerous to free expression as the right and the left shirk and nenser corporations and government. Uh, thank you, Bill, so much. That's a fantastic um, uh, comment, and I'll, I'll try and be brief so we can get maybe to a couple more questions. But um, you know, I agree fully with what you're saying, and um, I just want to reference a, an article maybe six, seven years ago in the in the Globe Mail that was basically saying um, because universities uh, it, 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 moving in this corporate direction as they are, 
are doing more, say, property development, and I know my university is, and UBC across the city is as well, that university professors um, are really not, unless they have a specific research interest in real estate economics, for example, um, are, are not well prepared to lead universities because of this, right? So you have these external forces coming into play. Um, the, 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 uh, Ginsburg's book on the fall of the faculty talks about the need for faculty representation at the board of governor's level, at the very highest level, where it really matters. But, you know, this, this isn't forthcoming anytime soon. Uh, so I think this is, uh, this is really crucial. In terms of teaching, absolutely right. The kinds of things that we want to get our, teach, our students to do in the classroom aren't always going to make us popular. But are they going to, you know, are, are, are those things going to help the students learn and develop and become, you know, um, uh, in a sense, more um, critical and, 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 uh, and aware and um, better prepared for the next step in their education? Um, you know, uh, those sorts of things have to be, in a sense, carried through on. And so it's not a popularity con contest, but it's becoming more and more so. So thank you very much. That's a really excellent couple of points. Hello. Okay. Um, so we have a question from, or actually have one from uh, William McNally uh, that he, uh, he doesn't have a microphone, so I'm going to read it uh, for him. Let me just get it out here. Uh, and of course, just having some technical difficulty. Give me a moment. Okay. Uh, is the increasing reliance on foreign students as a source of revenue another example of corporatization of universities and arguably one of the largest threats to academic freedom, in particular the leverage of the uh, Communist Party of China has over discussion of liberty uh, in Hong Kong? And my, I'll put my part in that uh, Confucius Institutes uh, as, a, as an example as well. That, that last part I've, I've thrown in. Well, thanks. It's, uh, I mean, I think there's two parts to it. There's one of uh, in, the university's increasing reliance on international students and therefore differential tuition fees um, in general. And then there's a question of Chinese students in, in particular. Um, I don't really know too much about Confucius Institutes. I think I have a certain understanding of, of what the role may be. Uh, I myself have taught and lectured uh, in China, uh, taught uh, uh, for about six weeks in uh, Nanjing and Suzhou, uh, and my academic freedom uh, was was not limited. Uh, I'm that's I, you know a visiting scholar, uh, and so I think very different conditions applied to me. Whereas when I talked to my colleagues, there were certain topics that they simply did not want to broach, um, and so it was very clear that there were uh, very uh, 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 strong constraints on academic freedom, no doubt, no doubt. Um, boy, I've had students also from uh, the, uh, uh, the PRC uh, in, in my classroom, uh, in fact, at a Prague Field School, and we went to see Teretzin and talk about uh, the Holocaust, um, and the student wanted to talk about, uh, that student was, was particularly interested in going to see these um, these sites and, and, and these camps and was talking about some of the uh, contemporary analogies uh, with what's going on with the uh, Uyghur. And so I thought that was uh, really quite fascinating um, to maybe insinuate that international students from China are uh, playing some kind of nefarious role. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't see any evidence uh, of that, so I'm not going to comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samir. Our next question is going to be uh, from Paul Johnson. Oh, hi again. Um, yeah, um, um, Samir, I found the, uh, your comments around the corporatization of the university as, as being a, um, a broader threat even to academic freedom, a really interesting one, um, if I understood that correctly. So my question is, um, what, what are your thoughts about the of media in influencing um, um, issues of academic freedom in the academy. So, you know, I've seen a few articles lately that um, there are claims that the, the major media of, uh, in Canada is becoming increasingly homogeneous, um, 
being uh, dominated by, by left-leaning ideologues. And are, are we in a situation now where the media is informing academia and students rather than the other way around? Um, and do, do you think that academics and SAFs, for that matter, have a, um, a role or should start calling out the media for you know, exaggeration and, and bias and so on, and going after um, academics um, and even politicians, I guess, in a, in a sensorial way. Um, you know, going back to, you know, a, a little bit of an earlier discussion um, around um, um, climate change, for example, you know, a few, a few headlines that I came across just this week. Um, We've got one on the UNESCO World Heritage, or sorry, UNESCO site, um, an article by a professor of political theory at the University of Exeter, and quote, she says, um, climate crimes must be brought to justice. The damage that climate deniers do is heinous, and they, uh, the time has come to prosecute them. Um, Wikipedia um, has a, an article for deletion that is now deleted, the list of scientists who disagree with the scientific consensus on global warming. These are just scientists who disagree <laughs> with the consensus on global warming. Uh, uh, here's one, Climate Depot, uh, green activist David Suzuki says, uh, climate skeptics should be thrown in jail. I mean, maybe that's the ultimate form of, of censoring. What really surprised me was that there was no response that I could see from academia saying, whoa, hang on a minute here, you know, I might not like the views of, uh, you know, the so-called climate skeptics, but I'm certainly not going to support them being thrown in jail or deleted from uh, Wikipedia. So yeah, just, uh, just your comments on, on the role of, uh, of, the, of the major media in Canada in particular uh, regarding questions around academic freedom. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, this is a huge topic. I mean, um, the concentration of the media is uh, is a very pressing issue for um, democratic societies such as our own. Uh, and I, I would uh, contest the idea that the you know, that the that the media is um, overall left leading. Uh, left leaning. I, I think it's quite the opposite. I and mean, we saw this in the in the election 2015 where in post media uh, you had and which is now expanded i think even uh, even more it's uh, ever more monolithic uh, there was uh, you know a, a kind of editorial that said well despite all of the problems with the, the previous with the, the, the current government the harper government we nonetheless um endorse it uh, and uh, would uh, suggest people vote for uh, uh the um the conservatives you know uh, and I think that these things make a difference. Uh, although, in case, of course, in that in that case, they they fail to uh, do do the job and get uh, the Tories reelected. So I would really contest that view. Um, I think that there is uh, a a lot of homogeneity in the in 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 the um, in the media. Um, at the same time, I'm not going to put myself in a position where I'm attacking the media. But I do think that one has to look at questions of, of ownership and influence. Um, and I think that's the same thing when we look at uh, pharmaceutical industries and their impact on uh, the healthcare industry in the United States, especially um, in funding, uh, defunding of research. And we think of the Nancy Oliveri case, uh, where her findings were not exactly well received by a particular drug company that then sought to uh, pull her, her funding and so on. These are really uh, important uh, questions, as um, is the, um, you know, the climate science and, 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 and climate denial. And, and I think I could uh, cite uh, any number of, of articles um, that link uh, interested parties, notably the, the, the Koch brothers, uh, with climate denialism. Follow the money. Let's ask those questions. What is the relationship here? Uh, between this very interested funding, not arm's length at all, and uh, specific kinds of conclusions that, uh, that are arrived at. You have the Fraser Institute, which is very well funded also by the Koch uh, brothers, which has a particular kind of agenda that it is forwarding. 
I'd ask the question, how does this work with uh, disinterested objective scientific research? Those are interesting questions. I don't then have any particular substantive uh, um, conclusions to draw, but those are very important questions, as I, as I hope you would also uh, agree uh, that need to be asked. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a follow up on that. You know, of course, that was a major point in the Michael Moore film that, you know, follow the money while there's a, a tremendous amount of money, even from the Koch brothers, which shocked me. Uh, they're involved in manufacturing of, uh, of solar panels. Or <laughs> they're benefiting from this discussion. Doesn't matter where it goes. Um, but uh, so I guess one of my questions would be, um, should- sorry, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we're actually running out of time. So, um, and we have one more question that we wanted to fit in, uh, which is uh, Philip, uh, uh, Philip Sullivan uh, is going to join us and ask his question. And after that, we're going to uh, bring, uh, bring the session to an end. Thank you. Philip, are you there? Hopefully. Uh, Can you hear me now? There we go. Yes. I just want to make a comment about the, I wasn't sure um, where, where to make it, but recently uh, I was involved in a discussion group about the role of indigenous knowledge in the university. And um, I thought this might be an interesting comment to conclude with. Uh, there was an article by, in the Okufa magazine, uh, Academic Questions, uh, in which by one David Newhouse, who is professor of in indigenous studies, and uh, big business administration at Trent. And his comment was, how does one practice respect for indigenous knowledge in a community based on the notion of, di of challenge as a fundamental approach to determining truth? Did that come across? It seems to me that that's totally anti, anti, anti well, it's against the, what I understand the university community to be which raises huge problems about the inclusion of indigenous knowledge. Thank you very much for that question. I think this is really um, uh, at the nub uh, of, of, of so many questions, you know. Yeah. Uh, what does real inclusion in the university look like? And, and I would hope, and let, let's, maybe I'd like to finish on this note, um, I would hope that the university going forward, because the university isn't a static thing. It has changed over time, as we know, um, over centuries, you know. Uh, its role and function in society has changed, its procedures, um, it, it, you know, its relationship to uh, existing uh, authorities, state, church, and so on has changed over time, right? And so I would expect that going forward and we take the TRC, you know, I take the TRC and, and its, uh, its finding and findings and its uh, action um, uh, items uh, uh, seriously and, and I think one of those things is to really look at how the university can um, be hospitable to not just indigenous students and professors but indigenous forms of knowledge just as we in, in my department we are um thinking about the humanities i'm coming from a humanities department grounded in the western tradition i myself am grounded in that tradition but we also want to open spaces for for um dialogue with asian traditions but also indigenous ones as well i think this is important and i think this is part of the let's say the hermeneutics of um the university insofar as we are pursuing mutual understanding in 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 some way interpretation and mutual understanding uh, but unless we want to give up on scientific research, including medical research and, and, and so on, um, we have to keep that also very much front and center within the university because this is, um, you know, the, the, the rational adjudication of knowledge claims through empirical research. This is something that we cannot um, simply put to one side. It's, it's so key to the university. How can we though also with that mandate in place include other ways of understanding the world? We do that in humanistic um, endeavors and I think we can also do that in, in terms of different cultural approaches. True. And I, I, I am not authorizing a full-blown relativism but I am trying to articulate the need for some sense of yeah, hermeneutic mutual uh, understanding. And I think that's, I'm hoping that this is where things will go. I, I don't know if this adequately 
uh, addresses your question, question, but this is maybe the starting point, at least for, for how I would uh, understand uh, an answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for your question, Philip. And thank you very much for answering uh, all of these, uh, Samir. Um, I'm going to call on Mark uh, Mercer to come back on uh, and say a, maybe That's a few great. last words. Uh, once uh, Mark is done, I'm going to end the recording and uh, end the meeting uh, once once we're finished. And for those of us who are members of uh, the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship, there will be a uh, business meeting uh, following this. And uh, once we've finished this meeting, once I end it, uh, I will start that one. And you can join with the information that you were uh, previously sent. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I guess uh, we'll have a quick uh, bathroom break and then those who are SAFS members come back to the um, uh, the uh, link that uh, uh, for the uh, business meeting, we'll have the business meeting. Samir, thank you very much. It's uh, another disappointment that we can't uh, applaud uh, your, <laughs> your presentation. Uh, and so uh, we're left with this uh, um, uh, uh, thank you and, and then silence. Uh, but uh, it was uh, very stimulating, um, uh, terrific ideas. Um, I do think that many of the things that you think uh, aren't discussed have been discussed by SAFs. Uh, <laughs> maybe not, uh, again, the, uh, the waiting thing that, uh, that Bill mentioned, maybe not as, um, uh, as often or as deeply as, as we should, but, uh, but there it is. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, the, um, uh, the Freddie lecture last night and the, uh, the keynote address today. Um, and um, uh, uh, we hope uh, you'll uh, contribute to the newsletter and that uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk with you in the future. Um, thank you everyone for, uh, uh, for coming to the, uh, the sessions today um, on, on Zoom as they had to be. And uh, we'll see some of you, uh, the, uh, the SAFS members, uh, in uh, uh, five, ten minutes at the, uh, at the um, uh, business meeting. Uh, thanks again, Samir, and uh, goodbye everyone. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.